So, so just building on this morning, it seems to me that there's an interesting uh, theme emerging around understanding and data. So the one, of course, is we've had a wonderful set of insights about, if you will, official statistics and representations and some fancy footwork with regressions and so forth. Then we've had interesting perspectives on the importance of qualitative understandings. And again, with the quantitative bent in terms of quality of life and so on. And then I think we've also had reflections on the importance and the work that, that, that Ricky has presented where they decided to do more qualitative work, to actually ask people their views and get a sense of qualitative experiences. And then I think we've just heard a third uh, a set of, 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 uh, of knowledge uh, areas, which one can, I suppose, call uh, insurgent practices, Jackie and Jorgen's presentations, where what people do in and of themselves represent really important insights and clues about how do we think about a response. Then to move on to the question of design and responses, we're talking about three scales here. We're talking about within the household, improving living conditions, uh, uh, air pollution and so on. At the neighborhood scale, the importance of open space. And then of course, how all of this articulates at the city region scale or at the metropolitan scale. So were those just summary of reflections on some of the themes and connections for this morning and between the talks. I'm inviting people to make comments, ask questions of clarification, and to be very brief so that we can democratize the space as much as possible. And if you could also just to remind you, introduce yourself very briefly before you pose your question or make your comment. The floor is open. Thanks. Rather than ask, uh, well, here's my question. Uh, I would like to ask one of the speakers, Anthony Ye, the planner, to respond and give his reactions to the talk uh, by Jackie Kwok and Jorgen, because uh, they, they raise interesting issues and it would be interesting to, to hear the response back from the planner. Well, thank you for questions. Actually, I was thinking about it, you know, when they would present a paper. What is my reaction, right? Right, and it's very simple. If we are talking about planning, you know, try to house 400,000 people within one square kilometers, can you do the type of you know, self-help housing that we are talking about, right? It's impossible, right? So I think it's talking about the scale, uh, this one issue. The other issue is I was talking about, you know, when we're looking at this, is that whether you would like to have more communal space, that is open space, or you want to have your own private space. I think this is also this type of debate, right? Whether you want to sacrifice, you know, your personal space to your so-called um, external space. But the more important thing is about the affordability. Everybody, even in Hong Kong, would like to have something like, you know, what you've been seeing in uh, uh, um, uh, Monsambi, right? Because, you know, everybody would like their own house. But can you afford it unless you are trying to, everybody like to uh, occupy the land illegally in Hong Kong, right? And so it's also about the scale issues, about the ownership issues, about you know, um, you know the uh, trade-off issues, and also uh, uh, I think uh, more importantly, you know, uh, with such a large populations uh, within uh, one square kilometers, and you are talking about 400 million people, will it be realistic? Thanks. Uh, behind. Can I move on if you don't mind, please? Okay. Behind. Um, Johannes Fieser, uh, University of Braunschweig, Germany. Um, the two latter presentations, they highlighted for me the necessity of um, providing space to be appropriated by people in the city. And I think the, the possibility of appropriation is actually um, very central to well-being. So it is a highly relevant um, um, aspect of um, well-being in the city. So I wonder um, what could be a future for a city like Hong Kong. Can a city be sustainable on the long run without offering possibilities for people to genuinely appropriate space in a way as, um, for example, the suburban cities of the United States or the, the sprawling environments of Europe um, provide this possibility. Can there be any sustainable city development without allowing people um, shape their own spaces? 
Can I ask uh, from the panel who wants to respond? So we can, uh, uh, may I uh, give a brief response to Professor Yes? Uh, I mean, uh, reflection on our uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Ye said uh, that uh, uh, we got to have some kind of trade-off uh, to develop a communal space. And uh, if I understand correctly, uh, 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 he says that uh, it is not realistic uh, to have, uh, I mean, uh, this kind of uh, public space uh, uh, which can allow a free expression of people uh, in a highly densely populated region. But uh, now we have the case. Uh, it is real, uh, although it is uh, illegal. S but uh, actually, the, I mean, uh, the uh, older people, uh, they, uh, I mean, they now uh, have some kind of uh, consensus uh, with the government and they try their best uh, to participate into the planning and design uh, panel or, uh, or, uh, uh, of the government to, to uh, I mean, to uh, uh, impose their design. Uh, on the Duckling Hill. So actually, uh, if the people don't fight against uh, this kind of uh, programmed uh, space, uh, they will not have the free, uh, their uh, uh, space for free, uh, free expression. So uh, the people has to fight. Uh, just like uh, Lefebvre said, uh, the revolution has to be urban. This is what uh, the people is doing, especially uh, the older people. So they are very old. Uh, I'm uh, older than the age of 70, so they are still fighting. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, Please, if, I, uh, if I can put some comments, I think one of the problems. Uh, yes, um, I'm Paul Yip. I'm the, um, the, the doing the work with uh, Ricky on the this uh, uh, housing problem. I think one thing what we have seen in Hong Kong, I think for the past 20 years, I mean, it doesn't matter our, our GDP has gone up by so much, but the living space of the Hong Kong people has not been improved. I think now, I think one of the, st uh, one of the articles, I think there's a misprint there. I think we are talking about half of our household we are living is less than 500 square feet less than 500 square, half of our household. So what we are talking about now, I mean, the, the, the limiting of the household space, it actually, it re-affect not only the physical health, it's also the social engagement. We are talking about the people, uh, they would not be able to invite their friends to come to their house. So this uh, establishment, this social contact itself has been severely uh, uh, affected. So I think, uh, I, I think there's one thing you, in Hong Kong, I think, uh, I think the Hong Kong government always saying this, well, I think uh, now we don't have any problem to live on street, everybody ha have a shelter. But I think we have reached a stage that we cannot just simply live with this sort of condition. No, we have to move on. I think we have to something that we have to do something about this. Tong Chong from the National University of Singapore. I think uh, that exchange between uh, Anthony and Jackie perhaps was done uh, really at, at different scales. There, there shouldn't be this kind of contention because I think in Singapore, if you look at uh, what we've been doing, uh, some of the things that we've been doing are very modest projects to involve uh, people. And in particular, we're talking about community gardens. Now, surely uh, something as modest as that allow for, for residents to actually participate in designing what kinds of things they want. But at the same time, don't get at the kinds of macro issues that uh, Anthony talks about. So I, I, I think there is a balance really in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Do you want to come in? I, mean, I think we should try and also bring this a little bit back to what does this have to do with uh, well-being and, and health? I mean, to, to a degree, that's the challenge of, of what we're saying. And I think there is a sort of link between what Richard Sennett was talking about earlier, that um, unless you provide a, a city or uh, the sort of development that Jorgen was talking about, um, which is sort of informal, informal, difficult to understand, but it has its own... DNA, which everyone who lives there understands, unless you provide uh, the sorts of spaces where those complex sort of interactions between different uh, people without uh, 
excluding others. Unless you do that, I think it's very unlikely that you create uh, the conditions where people can let off steam, let's call it that. I mean, I think uh, you showed a very small scale sense of appropriation. But I, I think uh, one of the issues which comes out, which does link connected to design, is the absence of grain. I mean, there are many, many of these images that we see, and in Hong Kong in particular, I find it sometimes difficult to take the language you're using about communal spaces, well-managed, and then you show pictures that to me feel like, how the hell am I gonna get there? Or how is someone who doesn't feel that it's theirs going to get there? Right? And, and I think this notion of actually designing spaces or creating spaces which um, um, can be layered by sort of different activities uh, or user types is, is, is the big challenge for all of us. It's not in any way a critique, but um, I think that language is, is uh, to me, problematic of a well-managed space. I mean, what we found through all the interviews we've done sort of together is that people were describing in a very, very psychological way that the compression within makes them need use the space outside for other things. And it's just not part of our discourse. As, as architects, as planners, as designers, it's just, and there's no one in architecture school, who, you know, Rainier, who ever talks about these sorts of issues. Planners don't go down to the sort of smaller scale. So there's a sort of void there, which is a disciplinary void, which I think is, is really quite interesting and perhaps brings us back to even Detlev Ganten's points uh, earlier this morning about whether human beings naturally fits into a city. But anyway, I think th th those are, for me, important questions. Therefore, the concept of resilience of public space, whatever the scale, yeah. is absolutely central. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, Jay, a quick response to all these type of questions. Obviously, whenever we talk about planning, and people say planning is bad, right? Okay. <laughs> and I think that, first of all, I think, uh, well, in planning, we do, I think, think about uh, the um, user participation is very important. In any, even architecture building or whatever, we do respect uh, citizens' participation. And also, we have public engagement. But one thing I think uh, we have to talk about, for example, like this uh, Hill project, we are not talking about an area that we are being used by 400,000 people. We are only talking about, at most, only 10,000 people being using it, and we are talking about only one age group. For example, if we are talking about the public space in Central, and we want the citizens to participate in trying to doing that, right? That would be a totally different thing. Everybody would be fighting, you know, the kids want one thing, and then the elderly people want another thing. How, you know, you have to have a sort of like a, a balance thing, right? So I think the scale issue is very important when we're talking about uh, how the user can it dominate the use or whether we can have a sort of like institutional, uh, you know, negotiator thing of like a planner or like a manager to try to, you know, balance that, right? So the scale issue is very important. The other thing is whether Hong Kong uh, urban development is sustainable. My answer is simply no, it's not sustainable. But you still have to manage this unsustainable city, right? Okay. Now the other thing is about um, the, uh, the issues about uh, um, the, um, the, the uh, um, uh, related to um, the uh, conflict issue. And also, when uh, Ricky, you talk about some straight pole, right? And also, you, what I've been trying to talk about is the overall picture. And now you are talking about different historical development. Some Street was developed at the time in the 1950s, the 1960s, where the design standard, management standards is very poor. And so if you talk about housing management, it does not exist there. But then if you go to the new towns, it will be a different environment, right? So I mean, now we have to talk about what type of environment you are now studying. Are you studying an environment in the, developed in the 1950s, in the 60s, then I can tell you that it's really terrible. But if you talk about the environment being developed in the, uh, say, um, uh, 80s, uh, 90s, and 2000s, it's getting better and better because we are using better urban design, uh, better urban management, and also better planning. Better yeah. for whom? Well, it's also citizens, right, for the citizens. We, we, uh, so I think this is the one thing that is very interesting. I think you need to do uh, scientific research saying that this is the old environment and this is the new environment and ask the people whether they are satisfied with this old or new and then, then you can find out you know, what, what is the impact about you know, the planning and the design. Actually, we have done a lot of studies on that. And for example, we have tried to study the elderly or you like the older people. How do they adjust to the new town's environment and also to the 
old environment. Actually, two papers already published uh, in, interna in international journals about it. And then you find that it's a contrast, right? That is mainly because of the historical element. Thank you so much. I've got three hands. Well, it's now four. I'm not looking anymore. Um, and I'm going to give yeah. those four people a chance to make their comments. And then, if, and then we will be out of time. And so if there's any one of our panelists who wants to have a final word, I'll give them the space. But hopefully not. Please, yes, I'll start yeah. with My you. My name is Dieter Leppler from Hamburg, Germany. I think it was very stimulating what you presented. And uh, just I would like to make some conceptual comments. Talking about the density and the question you said the breaking point between breaking point between density and livability. I think it's a very complex relation between people, things like buildings, science, like architecture design, and spaces. And the dynamic force that we do are interactions. So finally, talking about density, it's all about the density of interactions. We are things and the we are people, things, and, and, and science. So uh, uh, I think this could be a crucial point. You know, you are measuring, of course, people per square, square meter or square kilometer, but actually what is behind are the social relations, articulating in social, in, in social interactions. And so I think when, you, when Anthony is talking about that high density living is more demanding, it's not just demanding in managing or design. It's mainly demanding in the question of social coherence, in the question of social competence, how you can live together and how you can transform this density in form of urbanity and civility. So I think this dimension of the social dimension is absolutely crucial. You know, people highly educated, good earning people, they, they can live in a high density uh, building, but as soon as there are social ruptures, you know, it, it will reinforce all the problems. So density is also a form of, of a buffer of reinforcer. So this is, I think, an absolutely crucial problem. Now, what I think is very interesting in the last presentation by, by Jürgen Andersen, that we are confronted with a different form of space, that this vernacular space being created via, via these informal activities shows us that behind this density, it's also the question of the multifunctionality. That inside these vernacular spaces, you, you have this integration of all these opportunity structures of living, working, and so on. And I'm very glad that he's not just talking about slums, but precisely as the slums of hope which can be really forms of city builders and that informality is a form, a mode of, urban, of urbanization. But we really have to care that it's not just the absence of the state, but that politics is demanded to really to upgrade it and, and be responsible for this development of this vernacular space in a real human sustainable space. And then these forms of density can really be an asset and not just a, a problem. Thank you. The, the remaining three speakers will have a quarter of that time. So, Gitam, you next. Okay, I'll cut out most of it. I'm Gitam Tawari from IIT Delhi. Uh, my question is related to the last two presentations and where we have discussed um, it was called slums sometimes, or formal settlements versus informal settlements. My question is that, can we look at it into what is there in self-planned settlements versus what is being planned by experts? And the examples we have seen is that in self-planned, the way spaces are being used is different. Our formal planners, we don't have that kind of definition. How do we make that intensive use of spaces that self-planned people are doing? And maybe they are giving us some lessons as to where they are locating themselves. It is access to employment, access to opportunities is what is most important. Whereas as uh, formal planners, we end up giving them nicely cut out plans. Sometimes it is 20, 30, 40 kilometers away from the main city. And that in uh, that example also we see that everything gets sold out and the land market has different dynamics. 
So my question is, can we draw some lessons? What is self-planned settlements are showing us for experts, which I think experts are missing out right now. Thanks. It's a theme I'm sure we will come back to in some of the next sessions. I move on. I wanted to make a few points and introduce yourself. I am Siddharth. I work for Urban Health Resource Center, an NGO in India. Uh, I think the last two presentations showed to us that lending voice and power to those who have less voice uh, has an important dimension as we think about all these things. And the scenario in Mozambique resonates with a large proportion of developing countries of this world and a very large proportion of the planet's urban population. Most of these developing countries are having cities which are growing very fast. So I think that situation is probably applicable to a very large section of the urban population. Uh, it also shows us how power balance can be better settled. So do the politicians or the private sector need, need to come in and resettle slums? Or can there be a power balance where the informal settlements have a voice, have a power, and they can negotiate that those who were trying to come and do a surgical interventions, we have a resettlement plan for them because they probably need some sort of activities which can be done in a different location. And it, the last point I want to make is what Ricky also said. When we think about something better plan, better for whom is what you said. And that's an important question to consider at all times. I think it's a direction of greater hope and it also brings the human dimension of urban design towards better health, better well-being, because we, you include more people in the dialogue. And the last point is that if we had people from informal settlements in the discourse here today, our discourse could have been more enriching, because they could have brought in a dimension of thinking, which as Geetam also said, we probably might be missing. Thank you. Can I ask our last contributor to be extremely brief? Thank you. Phil Wilson, Victoria University of Wellington. Thank you. I just want to reflect on the, the opening Sorry. remark that Ricky Sorry. made at the beginning of the session, and that is that we hadn't yet begun to connect this discussion of subject of well-being to density. And it's occurred to me in listening to the last few speakers why we haven't been able to do this. And I think one of the reasons is, is that the instruments which we've developed so far for measuring subjective well-being have not been oriented to this question. And therefore, they have not asked questions about your housing size, for example. They haven't asked questions about whether you live in a multi-unit property or not. They haven't asked questions, specific enough questions, about accessibility and getting around the city. So I think the real challenge from the discussion we've had so far is for urbanists to address the subject of well-being literature and say, what sort of instruments should we develop in order to answer the questions which we are interested in asking? The economists who've been looking at the economics of happiness have not been concerned with density. They haven't been concerned with anything spatial, to be perfectly honest. And it's only the geographers and the city planners who are now beginning to ask this question. So I think it's a challenge for us to develop instruments that will help us answer the question which Ricky raised at the beginning. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, none of the panelists are getting a final word. They'll have to insert their comments in later discussions. I'll conclude with um, just one observation. This was obviously an incredibly rich and dynamic discussion and bodes well for the rest of the conference. Um, but it seems to me that uh, one of the issues we really need to tease out is giving greater um, substance to a spectrum of regulation. So clearly regulation is required. You're not going to be able to induce urban form and quality of urban life without regulation. But is this regulation from the top down? Is it from the eye of the state? Or is this regulation that is able to work with 
uh, if you will, um, um, uh, the temporalities and the dynamics of, of the city as it is emerging. And within that, there's obviously important discussions to be had comparatively between when you have a GDP per capita of less than $500, hardly any tax base, limited state capability versus the kind of wealth and state capability that, that, that underpinned what we heard is the regulatory mode for Hong Kong. What does that mean for the regulatory discussion? What does contingent or, if you will, a spectrum of regulation mean within that? And can we, within that discussion, insert the beginnings of something more concrete about what Ricky said was, was the void in our discussion about what exactly is this resilience of public life, of cityness that we're talking about? And how does that manifest in a $500 per capita city versus a $50,000 per capita city? So on those thoughts, I want to again thank our panelists, thank the enthusiastic engagement from the floor, and we will break now for coffee, and because our speakers were so robust, uh, you only get 18 minutes for coffee, so you have to be back in your seats by 19 minutes past, so we can start at 20 past four with the next session. Thank you.